Welcome to another episode of Algae Talk, the show about all things algae. I'm your host, Ivan Pilov, and I'm very, very excited because I have a fascinating guest joining me today. Please welcome Ali Hughes, a PhD student from Strathclyde University from Glasgow. Hello, Ali. Hi, how's it going? Yeah, beautiful weather. I hope you have it too. Um, yeah, it's a little bit cloudy today, but we have been having um, unreasonably warm weather in Scotland lately. Ali, we, we have a lot of um, exciting stuff planned for today, but before we get deep into that, um, I would like to give our listeners um, some insight, some introduction, um, who, who you are and what do you do and how are you connected to the topic of algae and seaweed? Yeah, um, so I did my bachelor's degree, my undergraduate degree, at the National University of Ireland in Galway. I did just a general science degree, but specialised in chemistry. And for my honours thesis project, I got to work with um, a visiting professor, uh, Professor Bill Baker, who was visiting from um, the University of South Florida. I worked with him on developing a natural product library from marine bacteria. After graduating with my degree, I then got the opportunity to go over and work with Dr. Baker for two years as a teaching and research assistant um, in his lab in Tampa. During that time, I worked on um, marine fungi and also worked on some marine invertebrates and nudibranchs as well. And then after two years there, I applied for a PhD um, at, with Dr. Catherine Duncan um, at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. The interesting thing about the, the project that I'm on is that um, it's an industrial and academic collaboration. So not only do I have my academic supervisor, Catherine Duncan, in Glasgow, but I also have an industrial supervisor in Zantella Limited, which is a startup company um, in Oban. My PhD project is looking at the biotechnological potential of marine microalgae, specific focus at looking at their bioactivities, particularly antibacterial and antifungal bioactivity and the chemicals that they produce that are responsible for that. Wow, this is all sounds really, really exciting and uh, very interesting. And I also understand that industrial part of the project means that uh, not only your research uh, is theoretical and, you know, ends up as a PhD paper, but also gets into production or somehow, right? Yeah, so we hope that, that some of the findings from my PhD could then be taken up by the, by the company if it's of interest for them. And um, so they are setting up like kind of their pilot plant at the minute. And um, so we're hoping that if I find some some cool things throughout my PhD, that that might be the potential for them to bring forward. Uh, let's uh, yeah, let's get uh, to the topic, which um, which sounds really exciting to me. As um, as you mentioned, um, the question: Why do algae produce those chemicals? And then we figured out then they can be used, especially um, in, in the industry of healthcare. So where would you like to start with it? Because I understand it's a, it's a huge topic. And uh... I think it's interesting to look at the, the history of these things to see how far along we've come and, and where the field is at the minute. I think a lot of people are aware of, you know, the Greeks, the Egyptians and the, and the Chinese from ancient times were, were really great um, alchemists and were really great um, doctors if you could say such a thing. Um, mm -hmm. they, they were really great at coming up with these natural remedies for, for different ailments and they all had different philosophies and how this worked, but um, they, they were able to cure quite a lot of ailments um, using these, these natural remedies. Um, and that's kind of brought about the natural products field um, as science has developed and we've gotten technology and um, understanding of the world around us, um, it then brought about this field of natural products chemistry. Um, so this is where we then look at, so there is something specific that the organism is producing that is causing the bioactivity, um, that is causing its ability to, to heal or to cure an ailment. And so that's what natural products is, is basically we, we take this organism and we look at it and we try to find what, what is the specific chemical that it's making and then how do we characterize that and then bring it forward into different studies. So some of them are, are structure activity related studies. So you then get a bunch of chemists that come in, they change how the, the drug like molecule looks um, and then that can go forward to be like, okay, this is the best drug candidate that we have this is it at its like maximum efficiency and um, its minimum toxicity for people and then it can move forward to clinical trials and then actually be brought on the market as drugs and um, so there's a huge field um, and about two-thirds of the drugs that are on the market now are either natural products or they have been inspired by natural products in some way 
So a natural product, something that has come from an organism that is living in nature, that a chemist has picked up, um, they've been able to, to do an investigation into that, which has then led to a drug being on the market, which significantly improves human health. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and when you look at algae, algae has a very long history within this story as well, the natural products field. Um, and that's just increasing algae's role in healthcare and the interest in algae um, as, as an organism or a series of organisms um, has become really interesting um, because of the advent of scuba diving, which has allowed us to look at an environment that we weren't able to look at before about the 1950s. Um, advancement in, in different chemical technologies and different biological technologies means that this can be done in much more of a systematic way as well, which is really improving. When we talk about algae, we, we mean all of the possible types of algae, like not only microalgae, am I right? Yeah, so there is, there is macroalgae, which is your typical seaweeds, um, then microalgae, which are the eukaryotic microscopic guys, and then there's cyanobacteria, which are the bacterial members of the family as well. So there's kind of three branches within the umbrella term of algae. Um, how do scientists choose the types of algae to investigate or to research for, 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 the, for these potential biochemicals? So some of them have been taken inspiration from from old medicines. And um, so, for example, like traditional Chinese medicine, um, they have three types of medicine that they have. So that's kunbu, haizhou, and and zisai. And so they're used for softening hardness, for respiratory tract infections, for breaking down clots, for breaking down some tumors and stuff like that. It's basically, anytime you get a, a hard clot of something in your body that that these medicines are really good for breaking that down and relieving the, the suffering from the patient. The most common types of algae that they use for this remedy is sargassum, saccharina and porphyra. And it's been shown then that these organisms that now that people have taken those, chemists have taken them and looked at them um, more in depth, that they do actually produce um, polysaccharides and terpenoids and um, different compounds, different chemicals that are actually responsible, that, that do have that kind of activity and can be used um, for that. So a lot of it has come as an inspiration from the traditional medicine side. And then some of the rest of it is, is looking at what's available to you. So at the start in the 1950s, um, mostly people were looking at tropical water because who wouldn't want to go scuba diving in tropical water? Um, mm -hmm. So really the Mediterranean got really well studied um, the Caribbean got really well, well studied and that was just because it was easier, it was more interesting, it was more reliable to go scuba diving in these, in these climates. You know, you had more dependable weather to get a boat yeah. out so the divers could actually go because this was really expensive stuff at the time. Um, so those areas got looked at and of course the first thing that they started with was looking at macroorganisms, so looking at big organisms, looking at invertebrates and looking at seaweed. So often when you find seaweeds and kelps and stuff like that, they're in, they're in quite large chunks so you can just kind of go and take up a load of it. You can get several kilos in one, in one trip, so right. it meant that you had a lot of biomass to start. So it was really kind of, you know, some inspiration from, from history, but also then looking at what was available and what made the most sense to go after. And what about microalgae? You mentioned also that microalgae are being studied for that. There was a really interesting study, um, Yondalus, which is on the market as an anti-cancer drug. They found that they had, had this really potent anti-cancer activity. They wanted to make it into um, a drug. It came from a tunicate and they went and they, they got enough of this tunicate and they got enough of the compound to go into trials. Everything was looking great. And then Pharmamar took over the, the production of it, the industrialization of it. And they decided, okay, the best thing for us to do is to set up um, farms. So we'll set up tunicate farms, mm -hmm. we'll then get our tunicates, we'll extract it, we'll have loads of our drug. And they couldn't find it. They couldn't find the drug anywhere. And it turns out that the tunicate, living in its natural environment, made friends with this bacteria. And the bacteria was actually responsible for producing the, the main part, the active part of this chemical. And then the tunicate just did a bit of modification so that it suited them and so that it didn't wasn't toxic to them. And so then that came a massive shift in, oh, okay, so maybe it's not actually the sponge that's producing it. Maybe it's the microbes that are living within the sponge that you've got these like beautiful symbiotic relationships happening everywhere. And microbes play a huge part in that. Um, and as well, when you're looking at microbes, that's great because 
you can start trying to grow them in the lab. And if you're successful in growing them in the lab, then you don't need to go back out to the ocean to collect kilos of, of organism. You can just keep them culturing, you can, you can store them, and you can get way more of your chemical of interest than you can with just going into the ocean and trawling it and hoping for the best. Did they put out the drug after all in the market? Yeah, it's now on the market. Um, it's one of eight marine drugs that are available on the market. Oh, great. Well, um, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, fact that I've also came across while doing some, uh, not research, but okay, go- Googling um, for the topics that sometimes algae um, are considered or rumored to be Um, helpful against cancer. I think cancer is a really interesting one to look at, especially when you, when you think about sort of the Western world diet versus the diets of maybe parts, a lot of parts of Asia. Um, they've got much lower incidence of cancer than we do in the Western world. And speculation is that a lot of that is due to the fact that they have a lot more algae in their diet. And there, there is many, many papers, um, I've come across quite a lot of them, that talk about the the anti-cancer activity of different extracts from algae and from microalgae, from, from all types of algae, um, that then could be responsible for it. They haven't found a specific ingredient, like a specific chemical that algae produce yet that has anti-cancer activity that has made it to, to a clinical trial state. But because algae are, are really great anti-inflammatory agents um, and really great antioxidant agents, They're kind of being used in the border between nutrition and and healthcare as such and medicine. Um, it's really common now that you find spirulina and chlorella in tablets and powders. You've got beta carotene from Donaliella. You've got all of these ingredients that are produced by algae that then you can take as a, as a supplement or that you can include in your diet that can work almost as a preventative measure towards cancer and I think that's probably more where the activity lies. I think at the minute research is starting to shift to look more at the, the chemistry um, and by that I mean looking at are there specific chemicals that these guys produce that we could use as a potential drug. So that's kind of looking at the pharmaceutical side of things and, and that's mostly where, where my research is focused as well is looking at the drug potential and the, the pharmaceutical potential of microalgae. Up until now, because a lot of the attention on microalgae has been focused on biofuels over the past 10-15 years, and then basically people who are working in industry or that maybe have more of a biology or a biotechnology background have kind of said, okay, well, the, the numbers aren't really working out for biofuels, but maybe if we found another activity, another way that we can utilize this algal biomass, then you know, it might make things a little bit more economical. And so then people started looking into the potential of microalgae for nutrition and for cosmetics. And they've been really successful. Um, when you talk about nutrition, you know, you've got spirulina is, is the first one that comes to mind. So that's, that's a really big one that's on the market that's really important. But the thing is, is that the spirulina, it produces a whole bunch of things. It produces phycocyanin, it produces allophycocyanin, um, different phenolics and terpenoids, alkaloids, that produces a whole range of, of chemicals. And no one has really gone and said, okay, I'm going to take this specific chemical and I'm going to look at its activity against these specific ailments or diseases or whatever it is. It's just that, okay, if we use the biomass of the algae, which is, is really easy to get once you have your fermentation or you've got your growth set up and you get your biomass out, then all you need to do is dry it down and package it in a certain way. So it's quite a cheap process. Whereas then refining it to get, you know, your potential drug output, there's a lot of money involved in that. So I think people just focused on what you could use your biomass or like a crude extract to use for these treatments. And that's where all of the cosmetic applications have come from, um, where all of your um, nutrition has come from, because they just take the biomass and then package it like that. Then you've got the likes of hematococcus where they specifically take astaxanthin from it. And that's like a refinery process. Then not only do you have to grow up your biomass and then, you know, you've got to lyse your cells, you've got to extract um, and then you've got to purify your astaxanthin from it. And I think now that the field is, is sort of moving away from biofuels a little bit, but they've invested so much money into the technology, into the bioreactors, into everything that has gone into getting us so this far 
they want to find something that is that is beneficial. And so I think now chemists are kind of starting to step in and really look at microalgae, look at specific strains, see what it is that they're producing, and if that has the potential then to be used for for pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I completely agree, uh, especially about um, uh, hematococcus, because um, I happen to be working with this kind of algae. Considering all the factors, considering all the, like you said, spirulina produces a lot of different chemicals, how far are we from uh, really getting a drug from from any kind of algae? I think that with any drug, getting it from a research point to actually being on the market typically takes, I think, 10 years is the average. It has to go through rigorous amounts of clinical trials to make sure that it is safe for people to take, that it is actually efficacious, that it does what it says it's going to do, and then looking at like more long-term studies of it. So it's, it's quite a lot of time and quite a lot of money just going through that that trial process. In terms of finding chemicals, I think that the algal field is kind of being, its attention is being split in terms of chemists. I think a lot of the attention is looking at algal blooms and looking at toxins. That's really where a lot of the chemists are looking at at the minute because that's that's a massive problem yeah. and a bit getting worse. Um, but I think that there is a lot of people working on it, but I, I couldn't really say a timeline as such. I don't know, maybe by the end of my PhD, I've got about two and a half years left. So. <laughs> well, yeah, let's hope. Yeah, that, that's, very, that's very positive. Um, well, p- part of my question was also uh, about the um, t- technology side. Um, I mean, is it hard to get a specific uh, chemical out of, uh, out of algae mass uh, if algae produce a lot of them? So how hard it is to, to extract the exact one? With technology... A lot of the advancement in technology has come from the actual culturing side of things. So in bioreactor design, that's really where a lot of the technology advancements have come from. As I said, these are often produced in small amounts. They're only produced when they need it. And then we want to kind of exploit it a little bit. So, for example, with Dunaliella, oftentimes that's grown, I think, at like 100 grams per liter of salt. It's grown in like a really heavily saline condition. And that increases the production of beta carotene so you then get maximum beta carotene production at really high salinity levels that means then that you've got your biology kind of figured out so you've got a lot of your beta carotene being produced which makes it a lot easier then to isolate and to purify you have to take that biomass you have to dewater it particularly if you've got marine organisms you've got to get rid of all of that saltiness that's in it so you have to do kind of some partitions to get rid of your water and your salts and then keep your your extract. So you have to use some kind of organic solvents usually, or you can use critical CO2 to extract basically all of the metabolites or or a majority of the metabolites from the organism. And then after that, you're usually left with this like gummy, greeny, brown paste crap. (laughs) Um, And then after that, you have to go through refinery. So that's centrifuging. You've got... massive amounts of chromatography that needs to be used to actually isolate it out. And then once you have your product, you then need to make sure that the purity is at a high enough level that you can release it onto the market so that people can actually consume it without having any other byproducts in it that, that might cause harm. With algae, it's, it, it, they're particularly good because a lot of them are, are generally regarded as safe. So a lot of the ones that are on the market, they don't produce any toxins or anything that would be toxic to us as humans. So it's not so bad, but with as you look at some other microalgae, particularly ones that do produce toxins, they could have some really cool chemistry going on, but it's going to be quite difficult to get them onto a market for human health or to be used by humans in any way because they have the potential to produce you know, the, the shellfish poisoning toxins that then when, when people take them, they can cause um, amnesia, they can cause paralysis and stuff like that. You don't want to run the risk of that, so you need to have a really pure product coming out the end. So it really depends on the algae that you're using. As well as that, you've got some algae, it's really easy to break up the cells of them. And then you've got stuff like toms who have this, this silica cell wall, and they're really hard to break up. So you have to use quite high, you know, sonication or freeze drying and stuff to actually break up the cells so that you can release that good stuff that you want to, to make use of. So depending on the algae and depending on the product, there is there is a lot of work that needs to go down. There is a lot of, of processing and refinery that needs to go on 
which means that it is quite an expensive venture. But technology is always improving. Like we've been, I've been to, to some of the culturing facilities in China and I've seen some of the, the pilot facilities here in Scotland. And it's amazing the stuff that they can do and the volumes that they can put through. So this stuff is improving all of the time. I think it just needs a big player in the game that already has the infrastructure there to take up an algae and to start looking at it um, more in depth. And I think that would speed things along an awful lot. One can only hope. And uh, you mentioned your own research, which is connected to receiving or getting a, uh, a drug from, a, from an algae. What kind of disease can it fight? So my research, I'm looking at um, quite a few different strains of marine microalgae. So I want to kind of do a comprehensive study of different strains that, that kind of span across the, the phylogenetic tree because these guys are just so diverse. You know, you can't make any generalizations about algae. It's impossible. So I've got about 10 different strains that I'm looking at. And then basically, I just want to get an idea of what are they producing? What are the types of chemicals that they're producing? Do they have activity? Can we start sort of connecting the pieces of the puzzle? Because we know loads of information, we just haven't really pieced it together yet. The first thing that I look at is looking at different stress. So I want to see if I can switch on the production of these different metabolites, these specialized metabolites. Because oftentimes when you bring particularly a microorganism, when you bring it into the lab, you give it all the nutrients it wants, you put it in a nice, nice safe space, there's no bacteria around, there's no fungi around, you know, that it's, it's happy out. And it doesn't produce anything because it doesn't need to produce anything. So it has genes that are responsible for producing these, these metabolites, these chemicals of interest. And these genes, they can just switch them on and off. It's literally like a flick of a switch. They can switch it on and off. So when you don't need to be producing it, you just switch it off. The same way that we do it, we produce adrenaline in response to when we're scared about something, if we're excited about something, you know, if we feel threatened by something, we then flick on a switch, our body starts producing adrenaline and you get ready to either fight or flight. That's mm -hmm. the same with, with these organisms, with these microalgae. So you need to find something that stresses them out enough that makes them flick that switch and start producing the chemical that you may be interested in. So one of the things that I'm looking at is looking at those different conditions. So salinity, looking at pH, looking at different nutrient availability, looking at different light stresses. So different wavelengths of light, different photo periods, different light intensities, and how these affect the microalgae and if they'll then start producing some, some chemicals of interest. And basically what I do is I'll, with Xanthella with my industrial partner, I'll put them in that stressed out condition, I'll, I'll monitor their growth, I'll monitor their productivity, and then I'll extract them with organic solvents and then do LCMS. So LCMS is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. It's a method of looking at the metabolites. So you take your, your extract and you put it on an instrument and it will give you a chromatogram. So it will separate out some of the components within your extract because you could have, you know, you could have maybe a hundred chemicals in this extract and so it will separate them out and then it will also analyze them and you will get data back that allows you to then create what we call molecular networks they're basically just a visualization of the metabolites of the chemicals that you've gotten from the algae it's a bunch of circles and they all have connections they all have lines connecting them all around the place and what you have is that each of those little circles represents a metabolite, roughly speaking, re represents a chemical. And so then you can see that, okay, so not only does it produce this chemical, but it produces six other chemicals that are really similar to it because they're all joined together in this little network. So you've got a cluster of seven circles that are all joined together with, with lines. And then you can say, okay, so this is a family of, of chemicals here. And now that we have done quite a lot of research, we can then do what we call dereplication. And so that's then looking at databases, looking at other people's research who have identified some of these chemicals and say, okay, cool. So I've got phycocyanin here. That's an interesting compound. I know that that's something that I want to look at. It's got some really good biological activity. We've also got, you know, different versions of phycocyanin, allophycocyanin, for example, that's in that. But then also within that cluster, we've got two unknown guys, two guys mm -hmm. here that these guys are upregulated so we've got an increase of these guys when we grow it under high pH conditions, for example. So I know that under high pH, two extra phycocyanin looking guys 
being produced. And I can couple that with some really great antibacterial activity, for example. And so when I grow them under this high pH condition, I'm getting higher antibacterial activity. And I've got these two guys here being produced that aren't being produced in the other conditions. And so then you can begin to prioritize what you look at. So before you even go into doing any of the chemistry, you already have an idea of what you're looking for. So it means that you can be much more strategic about the way that you actually do this investigation. Whereas before we've just done just isolation. We've just been like, okay, cool. <laughs> here's the chromatogram. So as I said, when you separate out the components, here's something that looks like it might be on its own, that there's, it's not too dirty, we call it. So there's not too many components mm -hmm. in, in this one part of it. So we then call that a fraction. You just look at the fraction and just start, just start purifying things. And then afterwards you see if it's interesting, if it's a new uh, chemical, if it's something that has bioactivity, if it's something that may be of interest. But you've already spent quite a lot of time and money before you even get to that point where you've got a chemical in front of you. Right. Whereas this strategy is kind of doing the reverse, it's kind of being like, okay, here's some cool things happening. What, you know, using the systems and the knowledge that we already have, how can we prioritize those to look at these guys that are most likely the ones that are responsible for, for the activity that we have? So that's kind of the research that I'm doing is looking at that. Wow, this is this is fascinating. It it also sounds very adventurous. I, I understand that like uh, because of the technology that you have that gives you all the uh, visualizations, um, it's not like uh, going in the dark. But again, with all the data that you get, this is this is very very exciting. Um, like, do you feel on the brink of discovery every day? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I think that's just because because I worry a lot and doubt myself a lot with what I'm doing. But I that's, have gotten that's good for a scientist. I've heard. <laughs> yeah, it's quite common as well. Um, but I do feel now that that I think kind of the first year. So my my whole background was in chemistry, and then you know I decided to to switch to biology in a sense. And I chose microalgae, which every time I talk to someone who has a similar background, they're like, oh, you know, you really decided to punish yourself by starting with microalgae. <laughs> they're, just, they're insane. Like they're, they're so diverse. They're so different. You know, they can, my culture could crash just because it's a Tuesday and they don't really like Tuesday <laughs> so much. Um, so it, it, it was quite a, quite a learning curve for me um, coming into this field. So I'm about a year and a half into my PhD now, and I'm really just at a point where it's like, okay, I understand what's going on. I understand what I'm trying to do. It's now all, you know, the pennies are dropping. It's all starting to click into place. I've learned a lot of the, the systems that I need because it's quite a lot of computer work as well, which I'm not that familiar with. I'm, I'm a little lab rat, so I wasn't used to all of the, the computational tools that I would have to use. So. I had to learn those and get training in them and stuff. So now that I kind of have the computational side of it somewhat down and there's new tools coming out like literally every week. We've got a Slack group um, for my research group. We have like a channel on it that's for papers of interest and like every week there's some cool new tools, some cool new computational thing coming out that can help us. But it gets a little overwhelming, you know, it came to a point where all of the instruments were so great and technology was coming along so far that we were able to get all of this really great data. And then it was like, oh crap, we've got all of this data. <laughs> no single person could sit and analyze all of this. There's just so much information here. And now we're at the stage where everyone is producing computational tools to help us deal with the amount of data that we're generating. So it's a really, really exciting time to be doing science because like we've got instruments that are just out of this world that are sensitive beyond belief that can give you so much information. You've got bucket loads of data that you can then put into these different computational tools and come out with really meaningful information. You know, you can sift through all of the all of the mess. You can just really start being very strategic about the science that you're doing. So in that sense, I think it's really, really exciting. I don't feel like I'm on the brink of discovery every day, but I think it's a really exciting time to be doing this type of science because it's just progressing at a phenomenal rate. Yeah, it definitely seems to be doing so. And um, as for algae on Tuesday, yeah, um, that's a good excuse. That, well, I like that excuse for them. I mean, I also get those days when uh, when uh, things just don't don't go well. Probably that's because it's Tuesday or maybe Thursday. I don't know. Yeah, um, a lot of my friends work on bacteria, and they call them, you know, their culture is their babies. I think 
scientists <laughs> in general, we get really possessive about things and they call them their babies. And I'm like, no, I don't have babies. I have sulky teenagers. <laughs> That's what my- <laughs> well, if only we could talk to them and just persuade them to behave, right? We do try. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a little bit um, earlier, you mentioned the company that you're also working for, and I understand that that's the industrial part of your research. Yeah, Zampella Limited. I visited their website, just of curiosity, and I saw uh, some uh, nice pictures of uh, what seems to be a bioreactor, but a very small one. So uh, could you tell me a little bit more about the idea of that uh, company, of the product that they are producing? Yeah, so um, so you're right, Zantella produced bioreactors. That's, that's their main goal. They have several different types of bioreactors. So one of the things that's quite nice is that they they really feel strongly about bridging the gap between academia and industry. So they produce these small one liter bioreactors, which you can then give to universities. So for example, when I started my PhD, this was the setup that I got, which is really great for me. They then have, so they're the one liter ones, they have the standard microferros, which can work between 18 and 30 degrees Celsius. And then they have the cryoferrous, which is a new one that they've brought out, which allows you to go down to minus three degrees Celsius. They developed this one um, in association with the British Antarctic Survey. So actually then wanting to go and looking at, you know, now that we've done all the tropics, um, to go down and start looking at Antarctica and looking at the Arctic and, and the potential that's there in terms of chemistry and, and microalgae. So then after that, they've got the, the Cyclops. So I think that's a, a 16 litre at the minute, but they are developing a new version of this that will go up to 30 litres. So that's like a cylindrical um, photobioreactor. So again, it takes up very little space. So if you were in an academic setting where you needed um, higher volumes, then you could, and they're, they're quite small and quite neat. And the lights are actually inside your culture. So it's illuminated. You've got basically then just a cylinder of, of a light sheet that goes into your photobioreactor and illuminates it inside and outside, which is pretty cool. And then they've got their Pandoras, which is their, their big boys. They're going to be the workhorses of the operation. They are 1,000 litres. Wow. And they have just set up, we've just had some of my colleagues were up in the site this past week, up in Arden American, um, putting together some of these, these bioreactors. So they're setting up 16 of them in series, and they will use them then for growing spirulina. So I think that will be the biggest microalgal biomass production in the UK once they get up and running, which should be sometime this year. And the fact that they, uh, they have lights, uh, does it mean that they don't need a um, sunlight? Yeah, so I mean, trying to grow microalgae using sunlight in the UK is, is a bit of an issue. Um, at the minute, I'm looking out and I'm really warm here and I'm looking out and it's gorgeous and sunny, but um, <laughs> those days are, are rare and, and far between. So really, you want to have um, artificial illumination for doing it in the UK. And it's worked out quite well in that the, the price of LEDs just seems to be dropping at an exponential rate, really. Um, as that technology is developing, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to, to utilize LED light. They also work as part of the ASLI project. So it's an algal solutions for local, local energy. The ASLI project, A-S-L-E-E, -E, that you can look up online. So they are basically trying to use, because Scotland's great for um, renewable energy. It has a lot of wind turbines that you can use for energy. The way that the grid is set up in the UK is that you have to have a constant level of energy going into the grid. So a lot of the time, Scotland is producing way too much energy for the UK to be able to cope with. So you actually have to go out and spend money then turning on and off your wind turbines all the time. Whereas Santella, they want to use this excess energy that's being produced by the wind turbines, almost siphon it off of the grid and then use it for powering their bioreactors and growing up their algae. So that significantly reduces the cost. And they've, they've quite a lot of projects. They're really into circular economy. So having sustainable processes in place for growing their algae. And they have a really good connection here in Scotland and in the UK to make that happen. So they've got quite a few really exciting projects. If you find something, like you say, in one liter um, reactor and like you need to scale up, is it the same when we get 50 liters? How, how, do, the, how do the algae usually react to this? Yeah, biology in general likes to stump us like that. 
Um, I think it's it's incredibly difficult. It's why there's such a gap between academia and industry. There's so much great research coming out of academic institutes on so many different topics that just can't be translated into an industrial setting. Just even thinking about something as simple as centrifuging, like we use centrifuges all of the time in academic research. It's really easy. You get your tube or your vial, you pop it into a centrifuge and you like you spin it down. When you then go to an industrial scale and no longer are you talking about 50 mils, you're talking about 500 liters of something and you want to centrifuge it down so that you can get a cell pellet and start working with it. So like, how, how do you go about doing that? You know, you, you can't just have a thousand centrifuge um, set up in sequence <laughs> um, in order to do that. So there, there's just so many simple things that are quite difficult. And that's why the, the funding that I'm on, the IYC, they, they want to link people up. So they want to link up academics and industry so that we can kind of help bridge that gap. Because there's a lot of things to consider that when we're doing it in an academic setting, we're doing it in a plastic tube, we're, we're doing it in a glass vial. And then all of a sudden, when we go to industry, we're using stainless steel. That's a completely different material. We don't right. know how the organism is going to respond to growing in those different materials. You've then got to talk about when you've got much larger volumes, particularly with algae, you've got to talk about the light penetration. Are they all getting the same amount of light? Because, you know, if you've got a one liter culture, that, that's fine. You can stick a light tile on either side and you will get illumination through your whole culture. But again, if you've got 500 liters or 1,000 liters, how do you illuminate that in the same way so that each cell is getting, you know, its maximum amount of light that it needs in order to grow? You've also got to then consider your gas exchange because these guys need carbon dioxide and they, they release a lot of gases as well. So you need to have really good gas exchange. That's, again, a lot more difficult when you go from one liter to 1,000 liters. So there's a lot of things that need to be considered when you're, when you're scaling them up. Even, for example, I have mine sitting in, in Erlenmeyer flasks in an incubator. When I want to, to put them into the bioreactor, I actually have to go through a, you know, a sequential scale-up to get them to a liter in order to put them into the bioreactors. Because right. if I go straight from 250 mils into a one-liter culture, they, they might just crash. They might be like, nope, this is too much for us. Sorry, guys, we, we can't grow here. You know, you've disturbed them by changing their environment. And some of them just get stressed out and then they just die. They, they can't survive in it. So it's quite a lot of things to consider. And I don't think whether it's microalgae or bacteria or yeast or whatever, just know that that is such a painstaking effort to get from academic to industrial or to get from small scale to pilot scale to large scale. Really difficult. Well, and I, um, I also see that this might be as well a challenge for putting out the uh, actual treatments like, like we were talking before, right? Medicine, because not only you have to find the specific chemical, but you have to also figure out the way to mass produce it and not lose the ability of this drug to cure diseases. I'm also um, realizing now that a lot of things that I'm doing as a uh, as a worker in the algae industry is not recognized. Uh, I, f I feel I feel the challenge. But um, as as our conversation, I think also showed today that uh, it's a little bit quite far away. I think a lot of the groundwork has been done, but there's now we need more chemists to get on board to help bring it to the next stage. I think. Ali, it's been, it's been such a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for a chat on the, on the podcast about these, uh, about these projects that you have. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. I personally had a blast listening to you. And it's, it's really, really amazing. What science can do, can do now and what algae um, can do. The last thing before we uh, say goodbye to our listeners, where can people, if, uh, if uh, there's anyone interested in your research, where they can find more about your research, um, or maybe they can follow you on social media? Yeah, um, so our research group, the Catherine Duncan Research Group, we have um, an Instagram account and a website called Medicines from the Sea. So Medicines from the Sea on Instagram or medicinesfromthesea.com to find our website. That has all the news and information about myself, um, our two other PhD students, Laia and Para, and our postdoc, Alejandro. So we all work on marine organisms, but the, the other three focus more on actinobacteria, um, and they've got some really cool projects going on. I'm also on Twitter at, at 
Fablach 3592. So F A B H L A C H 3592. It means fabulous in Gaelic, and I thought it was great when I was 15. And now that I'm trying to say it to people, they're like, "What?" <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's my my Twitter account. You can also go on to to Zanpella's website. Um, so that is zanpella.co.uk and find out what they're doing. And the funding program that we're on is the iBio IC. So you can go to iBioIC.com um, and look at their CTP program. And you'll find more information about all of those different projects, including my own on that. I'll also add that uh, all the links, I'll put them in the show notes so people can uh, easily click on them and follow. For the meantime, that's been the episode for Alcatalk podcast. And um, till next time, we say goodbye to you. Bye. Bye.